It was almost 25 years ago that the APHC or the All Party Hurriyat Conference came into being in Srinagar, Kashmir. These 25 years have been tumultuous in the politics of Kashmir, but the allegation against the Hurriyat leaders have always been that they do what Pakistan asks them to do. We continue with part two of our person of interest, the Hurriyat leader, and we keep looking at the stereotypical view that one has of these Hurriyat leaders. Are they really the puppets of Pakistan? Or are they like any other politician from the valley? The question has always been that who is the viewer? Who is the person that is getting this information? And what is it that the viewer wants to believe? On the morning of 1st of May, 1990, three young men went to the residence of Maulavi Farooq, the hereditary chief priest of North Kashmir. They entered his office and shot him dead because he was vocally anti-Pakistan, even though he was not pro-India. The death of Maulavi Farooq meant that the hereditary title and office passed to his 16-year-old son, Omar Farooq, the boy who would be instrumental in cobbling together the All-Party Hurriyat Conference by the time he was only 19. Like the teenage son of the slain Maulavi, the young men of Kashmir too were disillusioned by the breakdown of democratic process. But unlike Omar, they got pulled into the vortex of armed rebellion as the vehicle of protest. The youth in hundreds who had earlier campaigned for the Muslim United Front began taking up arms. When militancy broke out in the valley in 88-89 uh, or 89-90, it was all started with a, by a handful of boys, JKLF boys, Yasin Malik and his friends. And uh, after the 87 election, out of the frustration, they had gone across to Pakistan and they had got trained there. So this whole movement, as it is called, was backed by Pakistan. It was inspired by Pakistan. It was funded by Pakistan. So it was a Pakistani movement as such, but it was totally indigenous to the extent that it was these JKLF boys. But this grew very rapidly. It, it went out of control, out of everybody's control, and it surprised even Pakistan that how big this whole thing became suddenly, big in the sense of the violence and, and the militancy. That is when Pakistan started thinking its, its, uh, its moves. And uh, from just one JKLF, they thought of you know, bringing in other outfits. And they wanted more, more control over the, the movement for which they created at that point of time the Hizbul Mujahideen, which was a pro-Jamaat uh, Tanzeeb. Then in course of time, as, as the movement grew, uh, Pakistan thought it was also necessary to have a political body. And that is how the Hurriyat was created in March 1993 when militancy was at its height. The alliance of secessionist parties and leaders formed as a political front was held together by one common position, that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was under occupation of India. Within the grouping, the Hurriyat leaders themselves were divided along two separate but strong ideologies. The ones who wanted Jammu and Kashmir to be independent of both India and Pakistan, and those who wanted the state to become a part of Pakistan. It was a disparate set of parties, primarily separatist organizations. Um, the front face has always been uh, Ali Shah Gilani, Omar uh, Farooq himself, the JKLNF chief, Yasin Malik before that, and Shabir Shah, who's later on ejected, I think, from the Hurriyat. You had uh, 
some other very, very prominent leaders of the separatist movement who all came together primarily to unify the efforts, put together a, a common political front. Although there was a common political front, but you found that midway uh, there was a disunity. There was a, uh, Ali Shah Gilani's uh, very, very virulent kind of a philosophy of pro -Pak, being pro-Pakistan, while the others were primarily looking at Azadi as, a, as, a, as the means. So there was a split and you found the extremist and the moderate element of the Hurriyat emerging. Uh, I think from the Indian angle, that was a very good thing which happened. There was a time when it was, it was quite solid. In, I would say the, the mid, or soon after it was formed, let me say 94, 95. Then I think uh, Narasimha Rao thought of a master stroke and that was the 96 election. He said we have to bring back, we have to revive democracy and the political system in, in Kashmir, the governor's rule cannot go out. And that is what started shaking the Hurriyat because some of them then started developing, uh, you know, political ambitions. When was Indian government very sincere to resolving the Kashmir dispute so that we have to debate it? I mean, uh, was, was New Delhi uh, sincere? You know, if you, if you see the statements from, from various Indian prime ministers, I will quote a few. Uh, like in the eyes of uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in 1947, he, he promised a plebiscite to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Then you had uh, the prime minister, another prime minister like uh, uh, P.V. Narsimha Rao, who said sky is the limit when nobody was willing to fight elections in 96 in Jammu and Kashmir. And Farooq Abdullah had to be flown in from London uh, to, to, to take part in the election process when people uh, you know Indian army was accused of dragging people out of their homes to take part in the election process so then there was another uh, Indian Prime Minister um, Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji who, who never mentioned the Indian Constitution he said in Saniyat ke daire mein baat hogi that there will be talks under the ambit of Indian Constitution and then a very senior Congress uh, Minister and also uh, you know a very very senior statesman P. Uh, Chidambaram who said Kashmir is a unique problem which needs a unique solution. Even Karan Singh said in the Indian parliament that uh, Kashmir has, Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir has never merged with the Indian Union. It was a conditional access, accession, conditional accession on, on three important areas uh, like, uh, you know, currency, like uh, defense and foreign affairs. But, you know, how New Delhi then took away everything from the people of Jammu and Kashmir and, and still Jammu and Kashmir has a separate flag, Jammu and Kashmir has a separate constitution, Jammu and Kashmir has a separate song. Uh, so this is not as simple as it is not like any other Indian state and there is an article 370 no Indian citizen can buy land property in Jammu and Kashmir unless you know someone is a state subject so you have to see it that in, in that historical context so I don't think that Gilani or Mirwais or Yasin Malik or ABC has been a hurdle as far as the resolution of this problem is concerned despite it being an umbrella organization the natural tendency of the Hurriyat leaders was to pull in different directions. After all, it was a conglomerate of different ideologies and different thoughts who had just one main common goal. So it's understandable that within a very short time, there was infighting which broke out within the Hurriyat. And just 10 years from its formation, it split. When India under Atal Bihari Vajpayee and Pakistan under Parvez Musharraf were talking Kashmir, the rift between Mirwais Omar Farooq and Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani widened. Mirwais Omar Farooq wanted to talk with both the governments, while Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani opposed it. The two big Hurriyat leaders also differed on the question of militancy. Gilani apparently seemed more pro-militancy than the Mirwais in the furthering of his objective. In 2003, Gilani got pro-Mirwais Hurriyat chairman Abbas Ansari removed and replaced him with Masarrat Alam. Alam was believed to have deeper connections with the militants. And 
the reason for the split, it was attributed to us that, you know, we, we caused the split. But no, it was Pakistan which caused the split because Pakistan wanted a bigger role for Gilani Sahib at that point of time. Till Musharraf took control and said, uh, supposed to have said to Gilani one day, that out of the way, old man, uh, you're getting on in age. Because Musharraf wanted to move forward and he realized that he needed the Hurriyat because although it would be an India-Pakistan settlement, he needed the Kashmiris to endorse it. And who better than the Hurriyat? And uh, I mean, the split was so clear in, in, you know, when the 2002 election happened, even before that, in two, 2000, before that, you know, when Musharraf came here for the Agra summit, there was that infamous tea party at the, at the, at Pakistan house and uh, where Musharraf was there and the Hurriyat was there. And uh, there were clearly differences between uh, Gilani Zab and Lone Zab. Uh, Lone is supposed to have said then that uh, we're getting tired and the Kashmiris cannot sustain this. And Gilani took an offense at it and said, uh, we are not tired, we will never be tired, that kind of thing. So, uh, and when I think of the 2002 election, in fact, you know, Loan was killed before the election because somewhere Pakistan began to think that Loan might participate in the elections. I don't think that was true, but still they had him uh, killed. And uh, when that election actually took place, you know, it was the first time that the Hurriyat did not boycott the election and Gilani was very angry. On 21st of May 2002, in Srinagar, in his last ever interview, Hurriyat leader Abdul Ghani Lone was asked by India Today's Ramesh Binayak whether foreign militants in Kashmir should move out. Lone answered that he had welcomed foreign militants as Mehman Mujahideen, but now he realized that foreign militants had their own agenda and their presence had come in handy for the government of India to build a case for cross-border terrorism and that robbed the movement of its basic character. When Lohan was asked if he justified violence by local militants, he replied that the Mujahideen cannot drive away or defeat the Indian army. So there was no justification for armed struggle anymore. Five hours later, Abdul Ghani Lone was dead, assassinated by a fellow Kashmiri in front of the people of Kashmir. At a public function where it was expected that he would make an announcement of immense importance. When I uh, met him, uh, I could sense that he wanted to say something which Kuryat had never said before. He was in a mood to talk things which, you know, uh, separatists would have never imagined. So I uh, pulled out my tape recorder and uh, he got talking. The nub of what he told me was that uh, uh, the role of gun in Kashmir is over and uh, it's time for politics to take over. I saw a youngster walking up to the dais, whipping out a pistol and shooting Mr. Abdul Ghani Long. I think history of Kashmir would have been different had Mr. Lone survived because he was working towards uh, ensuring that separatists uh, should take uh, political plunge. They should take part in electoral process. So in that sense, you know, um, his assassination um, changed the course of uh, political events in Kashmir. In 2004, the Mirwais faction of the Hurriyat, which included Yasin Malik, held talks with the Vajpayee government. Mirwais even met the then Deputy Prime Minister L.K. Advani. All of this was not appreciated by Gilani, who had split the APHC 
in September 2003. In 2006, the Mirwais faction put its full weight behind Pakistan President General Parvez Musharraf's self-rule formula. While the Gilani-led faction of the APHC said that the resolutions of the United Nations were the only solution to the issue of Kashmir. In 2008, when the then JNK government decided to allot 40 hectares of forest land to Sri Amarnath Shrine Board, the Hurriyat leaders of opposing factions united temporarily. There were huge protests in the valley against the transfer of land and the separatists felt the urgency to come together. Turmoil to a certain extent has suited them. That is why it is important to engage with them because when you engage with them, turmoil comes down. You know? And when you engage with Pakistan, turmoil comes down even further. This has been our experience. And I think Modi ji missed an opportunity. There is no other option but to have dialogue, but to have a reach out in Kashmir with all the stakeholders. And as a first step, I think that people, the government of India will have to reach out to those people only who have problem with Jammu and Kashmir's accession with India, who challenge India's, who challenge state's accession to India, who challenge Indian rule in Kashmir. You, you have to engage with those people only because if you continuously try to engage with those people who are part of, uh, part and parcel of the Indian mainstream, then I don't think that you can find a solution. As the army chief has himself clearly stated a few days ago, uh, these are very dirty uh, wars. These are very dirty wars. And uh, it's not a question of a black and white where you say someone is right and someone is wrong. At the strategic level, in a game which is a national game, which has got connotations beyond the nation even, you will obviously find that the senior most, the highest leadership of the nation will play its options. The intelligence agencies will play their options. It's not a question of being aware that the Hurriyat is doing anti-national activity and the next day going and raiding them and taking them out. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. Ideally, in the mind of the public, that is exactly what should happen. Uh, as a bystander, as a common citizen, my demand would be the same. But being a part of the security establishment, I do appreciate and understand that these games are beyond these black and white kind of situations and everything has to be seen in the grey zone. There are many, many activities, anti-national and illegal activities, which the government has to tolerate sometimes, right? In order to see, let the picture emerge and let it become a larger picture. To nip it in the bud right at the beginning sometimes may not really effectively actually achieve what you are achieving, aiming to achieve. So Uriyat is now, yes, it is one of the players in Kashmir. But it has lost its role and relevance, I must say that. Now it is more seen as a party which only enforces shutdowns. It is very commonly called Hartal Party. I don't think, uh, you know, um, you can actually wipe away this middle ground as well. Then who, who do you talk to? Uh, would you talk to uh, the likes of people uh, like of Zakir Musa, who talk about, for example, Caliphate? Will, will you talk to them? Or will you talk to people who are wielding guns in their hands? Who are the people you will talk to? Ultimately, you will have to talk to people who <coughs> believe in the process of dialogue, who believe in the institution of dialogue. So I don't see, I mean, even, even, the, uh, even Islamabad, Delhi have uh, recognized Hurriyat as a stakeholder. Uh, if, you, if you talk about in a wider context, even if you, for example, discredit Hurriyat conference, you, you, you push them away. Uh, Hurriyat or no Hurriyat, Kashmir issue, Kashmir dispute will not go away. Kashmir dispute was there, Kashmir dispute is there. And you have to address Kashmir dispute one way or the other. You have to talk to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. You have to talk and have a dialogue with the youth of Jammu and Kashmir. There are people who understand the importance of the Hurriyat. Because after all, 
one of the main reason that the hurriyat still has some significance is because they feel that this is the go to lot ultimately you know if there is engagement if there is dialogue which which kashmir is craving it has to be with these people it has to begin with these people there is no love for pakistan and the kashmiri understands that kashmir is a part of india and india is never going to let go of kashmir so sooner or later you have to make a deal with with india and that is today the most frustrating part for kashmiris you know pakistan at best has been the kashmiris fall back position you know when they are angry or 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 more disillusioned with you then they say pakistan then the green flags come out and then jive jive pakistan and then azadi slogans and all that it's not serious it's never been serious for so, except for maybe 1990 when also it was not serious but there was a dream at that point of time but uh, so this and that is why the hurriyat remains um, important because the hurriyat provides that fall back because the hurriyat has this link with pakistan it has that contact all the time with pakistan i would say if we if there was no hurriyat we probably have to create a hurriyat for ourselves In Jammu and Kashmir, the published and publicized political agenda of the PDP and the National Conference (PNC), the two mainline political outfits, also border on separatist ideology. The National Conference wants Jammu and Kashmir to go back to the 19, pre-1953 status, where New Delhi, that is India, has control only over defence. communication and foreign affairs pdp seeks self determination they want self rule so in a sense they want autonomy from india now how is all this much different from what the hurriyat leader wants in the eyes of india the difference is not in what the hurriyat leader wants but in how he has gone about wanting it